Hey everyone and welcome back to my channel and to another soft spoken true crime video. Today we'll be looking into the disappearance of Craig Freer who was a 17 year old boy that went missing in 2004. I actually hadn't heard of this case before I started researching it and when I did start looking into it I noticed that there isn't a heap of information out there on the case and the information that is online um, is often very conflicting. So I got most of my information from Craig's mother, Veronica, um, because she did an interview on the Unfound podcast. And she has made several other media appearances, so she's obviously the most reliable source. The podcast was very interesting and definitely worth a listen, especially to hear directly from Veronica herself. But it was very conversational and I found it hard to find any super detailed chronological account of Craig's case. So I sort of had to write a heap of notes from the podcasts and other media appearances that Veronica did as well as from other sources that lined up with what she was saying. And I pieced it together as best I could. And I know that in America they say Craig kind of different. They say it like Craig but I'm just going to say it how I say it because I don't really know how to say it the other way. Okay, let's get right into it. Craig Allen Freer was born on 14th of October 1986, the second child of his parents, Veronica and Bill. Craig had an older brother named Matthew and a younger sister named Kathleen, and the family lived in the town of Glenville, New York. After Matthew went off to college while Craig was still in high school, Craig grew very close with Kathleen, who was four years younger than him. The two of them really seemed to bond during that time. Craig also had a lot of friends who he was very close to. He was an incredibly personable, sociable guy who was a lot of fun to be around, so he was frequently at his mates' places and vice versa. But Craig didn't let his social life get in the way of his schooling. He was a very smart kid and not long before he went missing he had gotten excellent results on his SATs. He was also very athletic and before he disappeared he was headed to be the captain of his soccer team. On top of all of this Craig also had a part-time job at a local grocery store called Price Choppers. He got the job when he was 15 as his older brother Matthew had worked there as well and Price Choppers was known to hire high schoolers and be a really good place for them to work. They were very flexible with hours, so Craig could actually determine his own hours to an extent, which was important at times of the year when he was busy with soccer or schoolwork. He started out as a bagger and then moved into the dairy section of the store, and Craig seemed to really like his job at Price Choppers. His managers treated him well, and he was workmates with a lot of the other people who were employed there. Working in the dairy section meant that Craig would often help the dairy truckers unload, and he was very social with the truckers as well, and would end up spending a lot of time with them during his shifts. In the months before his disappearance, Craig had reduced his hours at Price Choppers quite a bit due to his schoolwork and soccer ramping up. Even during the summer, he played travel soccer, so he was busy with this even after the school year finished. But he still worked around eight hours a week at Price Choppers. The day before his disappearance, on June 27, 2004, Craig had stayed at a friend's house, but he came home in the morning and briefly saw his mother, Veronica. He said hello and grabbed his work shirt from his closet and told Veronica that he was heading to work. Veronica was also on her way out because she was going to his sister Kathleen's soccer tournament, so their interaction was very brief, but it sticks in Veronica's mind because this would actually be the last time she ever saw her 17-year-old son. Kathleen's soccer tournament was actually just down the road from Price Choppers, and since the family were having company that night, Veronica decided to pop into Price Choppers on her way home to pick up some supplies. She figured that while in there she could say hello to Craig and let him know what time dinner was that night, but much to her surprise, Craig wasn't there. This perplexed Veronica and she went home and finding that Craig wasn't there either, 
she decided to ring one of his friends to see if she could track him down. Veronica was very familiar with a lot of Craig's friends because they were often at their house and vice versa and she was well acquainted with a lot of their parents as well. Craig did end up being at this friend's house and Veronica spoke to him on the phone for a minute letting him know that she had just popped into Price Choppers and was confused that he wasn't there. But Craig just told her that he was running late, that he was supposed to get there 45 minutes ago, but not to worry about it because he was about to leave. So Veronica let him go, telling him before he hung up what time to be home for dinner. Veronica had actually left the soccer tournament early, and at this point her husband Bill was still there with Kathleen. So Veronica asked him if he could call into Price Choppers on his way home and see if Craig had shown up because she had a gut feeling that something wasn't right. And once again, Craig was not at Price Choppers when Bill went to check in on him. While he was there, Bill spoke to another Price Choppers employee and asked them where Craig was and they informed him that Craig hadn't been working there for a couple of months. It turns out that Craig had actually been fired due to not showing up for work on several occasions, even though he had already cut down his hours drastically. His managers had tried to call him on these instances and Craig gave excuse after excuse until finally they told him that he was off the payroll until he could get himself together and be more reliable with showing up for his shifts. But Craig hadn't told his parents about this and it was obviously very shocking news to them. When Veronica heard about this from Bill, she wondered what on earth Craig had been doing when he had pretended to go to work each week. And this is when Veronica started to think back to some red flags that she had noticed with Craig in the previous months. None of these things were particularly odd as isolated incidents, so Veronica hadn't thought too much of any of them at the time, but in hindsight when looked at collectively, she could tell that something was off. So let's go over the things that Veronica recognized as red flags in that moment. The first is that approximately 10 months earlier, Craig was at a friend's house and this friend had a problem with stealing. So he ended up taking Craig's wallet and had taken a couple other people's as well. But then this friend's dad found the wallets that he had stolen and made him return them to their owners. So this young guy who was the friend of Craig's and his father showed up to Craig's house and he returned the wallet and apologized to Craig. So this incident was seemingly sorted out but was still kind of odd and what makes things stranger is that not long afterwards Craig's wallet went missing yet again. Craig told his mother that he had lost his wallet and she said that he had to get a new driver's license because he couldn't drive without one. So Craig went ahead with this, but the really strange thing is that a couple of years after he disappeared, Veronica actually found his old wallet, but his old driver's license was not in it. And this will come into play later, so just hold that thought. Another thing that Veronica recognized as a potential red flag was that Craig had done an internship as a teacher's assistant at his school that year, and he'd really given it his all. In fact, his teachers had praised him for doing so well. But for some reason, Craig did not hand in the final assignment for the internship at the end of the school year, which was very strange and out of character for him. Shortly before his disappearance, Craig had also borrowed out some CDs in his brother Matthew's name at a local shop, and he told his brother that he had returned, it, returned them. But when Matthew went to go borrow some CDs out for himself at the same place, he wasn't allowed to because he was told that the CDs Craig had borrowed were overdue. So Matthew was kind of annoyed and confronted Craig about this because Craig had told him that he'd returned the CDs, but Craig just kind of brushed him off and assured him he'd return them as soon as possible. Now none of these things are particularly odd as isolated incidents like I said, they aren't necessarily obvious signs that something nefarious was going on in Craig's life, but they all kind of suggest that he had something going on that was making him kind of absent-minded and do things out of his character that just didn't really make any sense. The last incident that Veronica grew concerned or confused about was that Craig's soccer team had held an end-of-year banquet, which was a small get-together that they always held annually. 
It was at this banquet that Craig was named as one of the captains of the team, which was a big deal for him, and afterwards all his teammates were going out to celebrate. And Craig was usually always the first one out the door for any social event. He was the life of the party, but on this night he told his friends that he wasn't going to go out, he just wanted to go home. When he told Veronica this, she just laughed and kind of said, you know, who are you? What have you done with my son? Because this wasn't like Craig. She had expected him to jump at the chance to go out with his friends the way he usually did. They did have a few relatives staying and she thought maybe it was because of that that he was staying in. So she told him, you know, you can't go out. You don't have to stay home just because your relatives are here. But he just really didn't want to that night, which once again was out of character. So all of these things, on top of Craig having been fired from his job and not telling his parents about it, were setting off alarm bells for Veronica. So that same day, after Bill told her the news of Craig being fired, she decided to ring his friend up again and try to get a hold of Craig and get to the bottom of things. When she rang his friend, he told her that he actually wasn't there anymore and that he had left a while back to go to his girlfriend's house. Now some sources do say that this was actually an ex-girlfriend and some say that it was just a girlfriend. So just keep that in mind. I'm going to reference her as just the girlfriend, but she may have been his ex, we're not exactly sure. So Veronica called this girl up and initially she denied that Craig was there, but Veronica could tell that she wasn't telling the truth, she was just trying to cover for Craig. So, after hanging up the first time, she decided to ring back and just said, look, I know you don't want to get involved, but I know Craig is there, can you just put him on the phone for me? Because at this point, Veronica had a bad feeling in her gut. She felt like something was wrong and she just wanted to talk to Craig and get things straightened out. So, his girlfriend did put him on the phone and this would actually be the last conversation Veronica would ever have with Craig and she says it constantly replays in her mind. Veronica confronted him about not going to work and lying to them, and she asked him what was going on because she was genuinely concerned for her son. She wanted an explanation for what had happened and where he had been in those hours that he was supposed to be at work. And at this point, Craig knew that he had been caught in a pretty big lie. But he was kind of elusive and just said, I I'm not going back to Price Chopper's mum, but it's all fine because I'm going to start doing landscaping jobs with Matthew. And he told his mother that he would talk to her about it when he got home. But Veronica said that she was pretty upset with Craig in this moment. You know, he had just lied to her and was acting very elusive and aloof about it. So she kind of yelled at him for this, but they got off the phone and Craig said he was coming right home. Now, Craig's car was parked near his girlfriend's house, but for some reason, he decided to walk home. Veronica had asked her husband, Bill, to go and see if he could find Craig, presumably not long before she actually spoke to Craig himself on the phone. She told him the address of his girlfriend's house, which was the Cambridge Apartment Complex on Washington Avenue in Scotia, which is a village that is part of the town of Glenville. So, Bill had gone over there and seen Craig's car, decided to stand outside of it and wait for him to come out of his girlfriend's house. It's widely believed that Craig may have seen his father at the car and knowing that he was in trouble, purposely avoided him by going out the back door and deciding to walk home. This obviously can't be confirmed because Craig isn't here to ask, but it's pretty plausible that this is something Craig would have done. It was only about an eight minute walk from the apartment complex back to his house and Veronica described it on the Unfound podcast saying quote, you walk down railroad tracks for a little bit, you cut through a little wooded area, this is a defined path, it's not like you're trudging through woods, and then you follow this pathway and then you basically end up in my backyard. So this was essentially a shortcut to their house and it was one that Craig walked frequently Veronica actually said he must have taken it over a hundred times. It was an established pathway that was not uncommon to use, so it wasn't out of the ordinary for Craig to take this route home. In fact, it was actually quicker to take this shortcut by foot than it was to drive back from the apartment in Scotia to his house. And this adds to the explanation of why he chose to walk home 
and avoid confrontation with his father. Veronica also thinks that Craig may have wanted to talk to her about everything before talking to his father Bill, which I understand, you know, sometimes you have one parent who you know is going to be more understanding or just easier to explain things to, and he may have just wanted time to cool off, so he decided to walk and think about what he was going to say rather than face his father immediately. So while it does initially seem very odd that Craig didn't take his car, there are several factors that explain him wanting to walk home instead. It was later discovered that Craig was last seen by a group of teenagers around 2pm that day, June 27th, 2004, and he was walking along the railroad tracks in the direction of his house. I'm not sure if Craig knew these teens, but they said that they called out to him and he turned around and kind of waved them away and made a shushing motion at them before continuing on his way down the railroad tracks. After some time had passed, Craig's father Bill called his wife Veronica and told her that he was waiting outside at Craig's car, but that he hadn't come out yet. So, in response, Veronica said she would call up his girlfriend again and see what was going on. But when she did, his girlfriend told Veronica that Craig had already left. In fact, the girlfriend's mother had looked out the window of their apartment and seen Craig leave herself in the direction of the house as well. And it was then that Veronica's concern grew even more, and she and Bill started driving around looking for Craig themselves and walking the route he was taking to see if he had tripped or something like that. They also thought that he may have walked to another of his friend's houses to call off, because they were all walking distance away as well. But Craig was nowhere to be found, and even after contacting all of his friends that they knew of, his parents had no indication of where he could be. As you can imagine, the bad feeling in Veronica's gut was just growing more and more. She later said, quote, When the sun started going down and his friends were calling back and nobody knew where he was, I really started getting scared and she knew that something was wrong, so she decided to report Craig missing to the police. But when she got to the police department in Glenville, they sent her away to the police department in Scotia, since that was where Craig had supposedly gone missing. So remember, Scotia is its own village and it has its own police department, but is considered to be part of the town of Glenville, so kind of confusing, I'm not sure if that's just normal in America, but I thought I'd better clarify that. Anyway, Veronica went to the Scotia police like she was told to, and when she got there, they told her that she needed to go back to Glenville, because it was protocol that a missing persons report gets filed in the location where the person lives, not where they went missing. And poor Veronica is just desperately trying to get someone to listen to her, and both police departments are giving her the runaround and going back and forth, neither of them wanting to take the report, which can't have been very encouraging to Veronica who needed help finding her son and wasn't getting any. But eventually it was determined that it was the Scotia Police Department that had to take the report because the place that the person had gone missing was responsible for the case. But even when this had been confirmed, they told Veronica that she had to wait 48 hours before she could file the report, and the police were trying to send Veronica away in this time, but she refused. She said, I am not leaving until I can file this report, so she was literally waiting on a bench at the Scotia Police Department. And when she finally got to talk to someone, she told them that her son Craig was missing, and that none of his friends had seen him, and she lifted off the friends who she had talked to. And the police just sat there and went, oh, we don't know any of these kids, we don't recognize any of these names, as if this was some kind of reason not to take this disappearance seriously. And Veronica just sat there shocked and said that it seemed as though it was a disadvantage that Craig and his friends hadn't gotten into any trouble before and so weren't known by the police. It's like they just didn't take it seriously. And they ended up telling Veronica that she probably had nothing to worry about because Craig was a six foot tall, 17 year old young man. He was probably just out partying and would come home after the weekend. But Veronica knew that something was wrong. She could feel it in her gut and she knew her son. 
She knew something was off, but the police just brushed her off. She couldn't get anyone to take this seriously right from the start. Because the police were not taking Craig's case seriously at all, about four months after he went missing, Veronica and Bill decided to hire a private investigator to try and help them find Craig. The PI set to work interviewing anyone that knew Craig or may have seen him that day, which is how he found the witnesses that had seen Craig around 2pm on the day of his disappearance, walking along the train tracks. The PI also talked to people at Price Choppers to try and get to the bottom of the story of what had happened with Craig, especially since Veronica believes that something must have happened for him to have stopped showing up to work. But the only slightly odd thing that the PI discovered through this part of his investigation was that while Craig was working there, he had spent a lot of his time out the back of the store, hanging out with the truckers that came to unload the trucks. But other than this, none of his co-workers said anything that could point the investigation in the right direction or give any hint as to what had happened to Craig. His siblings, Kathleen and Matthew, also spent time working at Price Choppers and neither of them had any issues there, so whatever happened to Craig to make him stop going to work remains a mystery of this case. Another thing that the private investigator did was bring in someone to search the Freer family computer, because this was something that the Scotia police had refused to do when Veronica asked them to. The family had just one computer, because this was 2004, so that was pretty normal, but Craig was often on there instant messaging his friends, and so Veronica knew that it would be a good place to look for clues as to what had happened to him. She said that at this point, she was actually hoping to find some evidence of something like drug involvement or criminal activity, just so they could have a starting point of where to look next and something to go off of but they found nothing. The private investigator worked for the Freers for approximately 15 months until the state police got involved. Veronica said on the Unfound podcast, quote, we got the local police department to actually sign a waiver to turn it over to the state police because they were doing nothing. The state police were immediately a lot more dedicated to Craig's case than the local police were and the private investigator turned over all of his findings to them and told Veronica that he believed Craig's case was in good hands with the state police, but to call him if they ever needed anything. At this point, the PI had done everything he could with the case, and to this day, Veronica believes that he did a great job with this. When the state police came on board, one of their first priorities was to find out what Craig had been doing during the time when he had told his family that he was going to work. And as it turns out, the answer was pretty straightforward. Craig had just been going over to his friends' houses and hanging out for a few hours. Now, Craig was very popular, so he had a lot of friends, some of whom he had been close with since he was a kid, and some of whom he had become good friends with through playing sport. And Veronica was pretty familiar with these friends because they were often at the house and she knew a lot of their parents. But the friends whose houses Craig was going over to when he was supposedly working often weren't the kids that Veronica knew. They weren't his core group of friends. So these friends were from a different crowd, some of whom were known to get into trouble and some of them knew that Craig was meant to be at work when they were hanging out and some of them didn't. Craig's best friends didn't even know that Craig wasn't working, so he was hiding it from them as well as his parents. When the state police came in, they also conducted several intensive searches for Craig, which included bringing in cadaver dogs and bloodhounds. They thoroughly searched and researched the areas in which Craig was last seen, but the search was made difficult by the fact that Craig had disappeared over a year and a half earlier. The Scotia police had not made any efforts to search for Craig. In fact, the local community had made more of an effort and rallied together to search for him before the state police came on board. There were over 300 community members searching for Craig at one point, and the local police, aka the Scotia police, actually had to get involved to provide crowd control, but this was the only time that they were involved in a search for Craig. The state police also brought in divers 
to search any nearby bodies of water, such as the Mohawk River, but nothing was found in relation to Craig. The state police have continued to conduct searches as recently as last year, one of which was documented on Cold Case 13. The state police actually reached out to the show to help bring attention to Craig's case once again, and it's worth a watch if you're interested. I'll put a link in the description. Although there are still so many unanswered questions in Craig's case, there is some information that has come out over the years. It's hard to say whether or not all or any of this information is relevant to Craig's disappearance, but his life has been put under a microscope since he went missing, and these are some of the things that are thought to be potentially linked to the disappearance. So remember how I said that before Craig went missing, he lost his wallet, and then when Veronica found it a couple of years after he disappeared, his ID wasn't in it? Well, this is when that comes back into play, because it turns out that one of his friends who Craig had hung out with when he was supposed to be at work was found with Craig's ID. So this friend, whose name was Jeff, was someone who Craig had gone to school with and known since they were kids, but wasn't ever really a close friend, more of an acquaintance, and it doesn't seem as though Craig did go over to Jeff's house a lot. Jeff was kind of known to have some issues. He had been in trouble with the police before, and he wasn't a part of Craig's usual friend group. So Craig's ID, as in his driver's license, was actually found at Jeff's parents' house a couple of years after he had gone missing. What had happened was Jeff's parents went to move a dresser, which I'm guessing was in Jeff's room before Jeff had moved out. So Jeff had moved out at this point, but I'm presuming that the dresser was in his old room, if that makes sense. And when his parents tried to move the dresser, they found Craig's ID underneath it. By this point, they had heard of Craig's disappearance, and they knew that this looked bad for their son, but they were too afraid to turn the ID over to the police because they didn't want Jeff to get in any trouble particularly because he had already gone to jail for a small period of time. However, Jeff's mother was talking to a friend at a restaurant about finding Craig's ID, and somebody at the restaurant overheard them, and having heard of Craig's disappearance themselves, this person contacted the police about what they'd heard. So the police went to interview Jeff and his parents, and they all insisted that Jeff had nothing to do with Craig going missing. Jeff explained that Craig had accidentally left his ID in his car when they were hanging out one day. Jeff doesn't explain when he found it in his car or why he didn't give it back to Craig, just that he and his parents were too afraid to hand it in because they didn't want him getting into trouble. Now this is probably one of the most suspicious pieces of information in the case. It is definitely very strange that Jeff had Craig's ID and this does point to him potentially being involved with Craig's disappearance. But then again, we know that Craig lost his ID well before he went missing because he'd actually gotten a new one. So the whole situation is incredibly confusing. Craig lost his wallet and his ID, but then they were both found a couple of years after his disappearance. And honestly, the whole thing just brings up more questions than answers. Another thing that came out after Craig disappeared was that the day before he went missing, Craig went to a friend's graduation party, and another girl at the party witnessed him talking to someone on the phone, and he seemed very upset, saying, I can't believe you're going to do this to me now. This girl said that Craig was secluded from the rest of the party while he was talking on the phone call, and that she'd stumbled upon him pacing back and forth and talking to this person, while seeming very upset and anxious. So this girl who witnessed this didn't actually come forward until 2017, which was 13 years after Craig had gone missing. She had happened to run into Veronica in a nail salon and told Veronica what she had seen that night had been on her mind for years and she just had to tell her. So Veronica believes that this woman is very credible. She hadn't seen her since before Craig had gone missing but must have been at least somewhat familiar with her because she does believe she was telling the truth and that she likely was at this party. So obviously the state police were told about this and immediately tried to track down who it was that Craig was talking to. 
Craig didn't have a cell phone of his own. This was 2004, so they weren't as common. So he'd actually borrowed someone else's, but unfortunately, by the time the state police started looking into this, the phone records were gone, and they were unable to access any from that time period. Veronica still has no idea who Craig might have been talking to because she said that most of his friends were at that party that night. And this might be unimportant, but it's worth noting that Jeff, the guy who was found to have Craig's ID, was not at that party because it wasn't his circle of friends. Veronica thinks that it may have been an ex or someone that Craig was maybe seeing at the time on the phone, but that is speculation. It also came out at some point that before he disappeared, Craig was using and selling small amounts of marijuana. I'm not exactly sure how this was discovered, but it doesn't seem to be a substantial clue in his disappearance, or something that investigators have considered a solid lead. Another minor piece of information is that Craig did run away once in seventh grade. But, once again, this doesn't seem to be hugely relevant to his disappearance. One last thing that came up after Craig went missing was that in 2019, 15 years after Craig went missing, one of his co-workers from Price Choppers came forward and said that he had seen Craig a few days after June 27, 2004, which was supposedly the day that Craig disappeared. This co-worker, whose name was Nick Gallup, claimed that while driving to work one day, he saw Craig in the passenger seat of a vehicle on his left. Nick claims that Craig actually looked at him for a second before the car turned left onto Sheffield Road. Nick cannot recall the exact date of the sighting, but knows that it was after June 27th, because at the time, he had not known that Craig was missing, but when he showed up to work that day, Everyone was talking about it. Nick told his co-workers that Craig couldn't be missing because he'd just seen him. But for some reason, Nick didn't come forward about this sighting until 15 years later. If Nick really did see Craig that day, it once again brings up more questions than answers and could definitely be a substantial lead. But it is hard to have 100% confidence in this sighting, especially since it was reported so many years after Craig went missing. So that is all the information that I could find on Craig's case, and with that, let's go over some of the theories of what may have happened to him, starting with the private investigators' theories. The PI believed that if Craig was involved in drugs or criminal activity, excluding the minor marijuana involvement, they would have found some evidence of this, particularly on the computer because you need connections and communication for that kind of thing. He also believed that if Craig had had some kind of accident and passed away as a result, or if Craig had sadly committed suicide, that they would have found him by now. Ultimately, the private investigator thought that, while walking home, Craig decided to leave his usual route, most likely by calling someone to come and pick him up. And this someone, in the PI's opinion, was not somebody who was part of Craig's normal core group of friends. This theoretical person may know more about what happened to Craig or have been the cause of it. One theory that the PI put forward as to who this person was is a romantic partner of Craig's that he was keeping a secret from everyone else. He put forth the theory that if Craig wasn't hiding drugs or criminal activity, he could have been hiding his sexuality. Was this person a friend whom he had a secret homosexual relationship with and was hiding from his friends and family? It's certainly possible, and perhaps this person was someone who Craig thought that he could trust and turned out not to be. The hidden sexuality theory is one potential answer, but the PI also believed that Craig could have just reached out to a friend who he thought would be there for him, and unfortunately just put his trust in the wrong person, who was then a part of Craig's disappearance. It is also possible that Craig was preyed upon by a predator. We know that he had a lot of friends, many of whom his family and best friends didn't even know, such as the truckers from his work. Was one of these friends actually grooming or preying on Craig? 
and if he reached out to them that day, did they abuse his trust and do something to him? Or perhaps it was just a random predator who targeted Craig that day. These theories are what the PI believes to have most likely been the cause of Craig's disappearance, based on his discoveries while investigating Craig's case. Gloria Coppola, on the other hand, has a different opinion. Gloria was a New York State Police investigator who has since retired, but was the lead on Craig's investigation for nine years. She said that she still believes it is a possibility that Craig's disappearance was a result of suicide, despite many thinking that if this was the case, he would have been found. She appeared on Cold Case 13 and said, quote, We've had suicide victims found years and years later and further out than you would ever think. Gloria was a key part of many of the searches for Craig, and in 2014, while searching the area around the railroad tracks where Craig is seen walking home, said, quote, I think something happened to Craig within a few hours of his disappearance, and I don't think he's far from here. Gloria believes that Craig's lies are a huge part of this case, and that they are a sign that he is hiding something more. She said during the Cold Case 13 interview, quote, Everybody knew a piece of Craig, but not everybody knew everything about him. She believes that Craig not showing up to work at Price Choppers is a sign that something more was going on, and he was afraid to show up to work, but also afraid to tell his parents about why. Whatever the reason for Craig's lies, Gloria believes is potentially also the reason for his disappearance. Stephen Noto is a New York State Police investigator who took over the case in 2015 once Gloria had retired. He said in the Cold Case 13 interview, quote, Whatever happened to Craig on the 27th, it does not seem like it was a pre-planned event. Like Gloria, Stephen believes that Craig's lies are a key aspect of his case, and that, being caught in a lie by his parents, set off a chain of events that led to his disappearance. He said, quote, I think ultimately what happened was that he got confronted with this lie and he left and we don't know what happened after that. Veronica also believes that Craig was hiding something, and that this something was the reason that he had stopped showing up at Price Choppers, and potentially the reason for his disappearance. However, she does not believe that Craig committed suicide, because he loved his family, and he was especially close to his younger sister, Kathleen, who he absolutely adored. She just doesn't believe that Craig would do that to them. Kathleen was only 13 years old when Craig went missing, and as you can imagine, was hugely affected by his disappearance, as was their brother Matthew. Veronica said on the Unfound podcast, quote, It's very hard as a mother to watch what it does to your other two kids. Craig's disappearance was also incredibly difficult on Bill and Veronica's marriage. Veronica explains that with being so focused on finding Craig, there was no time to focus on their relationship, and there were times when she was so distressed that she couldn't even get out of bed. Bill, too, was incredibly stressed about Craig's disappearance, and unfortunately, the pressure was too much for their marriage, and after 28 years of marriage, they ended up divorcing. Bill has since passed in late 2017, but Veronica, Matthew, and Kathleen are still alive and still wondering about what happened to Craig. Veronica continues to try and keep Craig's name out there through media appearances, billboards, posters, flyers, and social media. And as we know, Craig's case is still being investigated by police. And there is now a $10,000 reward for information leading to Craig being found. Craig was last seen wearing a white, short-sleeved t-shirt and jean shorts with white Adidas sneakers that had three stripes on them. He was also wearing a St. Christopher's medal on a gold chain. He was 17 years old when he disappeared and would be 35 years old today. He was 6 foot tall and 190 pounds with red hair, brown eyes, freckles and dimples. If you believe you have any information about Craig's disappearance, you can contact the police or the National Centre for Missing and Exploited Children. I'll put the numbers on the screen and in the description.
And that brings us to the end of this case. I'm very curious to hear what you guys think happened to Greg. This is a very mysterious and perplexing case, so I'd love to hear what your thoughts are in the comments. I absolutely love reading the comments and seeing what you guys think and discussing the case with you. Personally, I think I lean more towards Craig meeting with foul play, maybe after asking someone to come and pick him up while he was walking home. I don't think he committed suicide or had some kind of accident, even though Gloria Coppola sees that as a possibility, and it definitely is possible. I mean, it can't be ruled out, but it's not my personal first thought as to what happened, particularly because it does seem that Craig was hiding something, and unfortunately, perhaps whatever he was hiding did lead to his disappearance. So I really, really hope that some closure can come to this case one day, not only for Craig, so that he can get some justice, but for his family as well. I mean, somebody has to know something, so it just takes those people coming forward to potentially solve this case. But anyway, guys, I hope you enjoyed this video and enjoyed hearing Craig's story. If you did, please remember to subscribe if you haven't already, and leave your requests for what cases you'd like me to cover in future below. And until next time, I hope to see you in my next video.